Hey guys, thank you so much to everyone who's joining me again today for Conversations with Ali Atwal. I have a lovely guest, um, Alaya Rogers from the Vienna State Ballet, and I will be adding her in here in just a couple seconds. Hi, Ali. There she is. Hi, Alaya. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Thank you so much for being part of this series today. I so appreciate it. Thank you so much for asking me. It's a really cool idea that you've started, and I think it's a really great idea to to talk to people now during these times. All we have is time, so. Thank you. I appreciate it. Well, anyway, I, I did a very, very brief introduction, but for those who are joining us now and who maybe don't know myself or maybe don't know you, I want to pass you this, you know, metaphorical microphone and allow you, of course, to you know introduce yourself, uh, talk a little bit about who you are where you're from and where you're currently dancing. Okay, um, so my name is Alaya, obviously. Um, I was born in California. Um, I started ballet uh, a bit late and I trained at different schools, like small, tiny American ballet schools. Um, I worked a lot with one Cuban teacher in Miami named Magali Suarez, which is where I met you. And um, from there, I went to Prix de Lausanne and the Royal Ballet School, and now I've been dancing in Vienna for six seasons. Amazing, amazing. Well, you know, it goes, it goes without saying that dancers across the world, you know, the world in general, we're all feeling a lot, given this, the current situation, you know. Um, more specifically in the ballet world, this is something that is impacting us physically and mentally, which is something that, you know, I don't think is always commonly discussed within our within our world you know it, it's so easy for us to be able to talk about yeah you know my foot's not the greatest today or my knee is not not having whatever this combination is but you don't really see it so oftentimes of you know hey i'm really not okay here or something is really bugging me um so mm -hmm. that's going to be kind of the, the umbrella category of what we're going to be discussing today but i wanted to get you know um, a bit of an update, if I could, from you. You know, what is what is currently going on in Vienna, um, and what are you currently, what are you currently doing? What's your life look like now, from day to day? <laughs> um, day to day is pretty much the same. Um, we are now in kind of a social distancing, quarantine kind of scenario since the past six weeks. Sure. So we're getting quite used to it now. Um, I think that n next week things will start to change a bit. The restrictions in the city are loosening. Um, we've really like flattened the curve here in Vienna. The rules were quite strict and Viennese people are very responsible. So everyone's following the, the rules put in place. So I think things will get better now and it will start to go back to normal a bit. Um, my day to day has been waking up having my coffee, watching TV. I try and do a little bit of bar like Monday through Friday. Some days you just don't find the motivation, but bar and some Pilates trying to focus on some strengthening exercises that maybe I wouldn't have the time to do normally in my working day. Um, and that's about it, mostly cooking and baking and watching movies and TV and talking to friends and family on Zoom. And yeah, it's more relaxing than anything sure no it's it's been different and you know it's interesting because i've had the unique pleasure of hearing from so many artists around the world and the answers to that question have just been all over the board you know with yeah. what is going on but the one underlying factor is you know there are some days when i wake up and it's just like what now what do I do now, you know? Um, and, and it's it's hard because we don't know, there, there's no timeline for any of this that's happening. And, you know, for a lot of people, especially younger students and dancers who have been writing into me quite a bit, they've been saying like, what, what do I do? What are people doing? Because right now on the internet, social media, you see this overwhelming output of content, which is lovely, it's great. And I think it's incredible that people are sharing more about the arts and ballet, but for someone who's maybe not as into it as we are per se, or maybe someone who's not as informed, uh, it can be overwhelming. Yeah, I, I think even 
even for me it's some days you just you don't feel like it you know when you don't really have the end in sight and it seems such an overwhelming task to get back in shape that some days you just you don't even try but um i think all you can do is when you feel like it be motivated and do what you can um and in the end you know i hope in a few more months we'll be back in the studio and working and yeah, I think you just have to enjoy the time with your hopefully family and friends and and yeah, that, that's the only advice I can give because I also certainly haven't figured it out. Absolutely. No, it is. It's it's ongoing. It's not that, you know, so many people have been asking, you know, what do we do? And and, and everything I say is just, you know, I, I don't have an, an answer per se. Mm -hmm. It's more of just this is what I tried and maybe this really worked or maybe it was an, a fail of epic proportions and we're going to try something totally different tomorrow. Um, but being able to communicate and being able to verbalize that I think is a really important thing. Um, I think that dancers, uh, maybe this is a bit of a generalization, but I feel that many dancers uh, were so uh, dedicated and we're so committed to what we're doing that we just dive into that workload and it becomes routine and anything else, all of these little external, you know, I don't want to say fears, but uh, external emotions, we, we, we tend to just push them aside and don't really necessarily always give them the, mm -hmm. the time to address them as we probably should. Um, and so I want to tie that into the first topic or the first kind of question is obviously, you know, this has been one that's come up a lot of times in this in this conversation series, and it's you know obviously dealing with stress and dealing with pressures as a dancer. You know, it's one of the unsung events that it just it's normalized for us. There's always different degrees of stress and different degrees of pressures put on us. But what advice could you give to maybe a younger student or a younger dancer who is feeling that in a very different way at this given point in time you know obviously there's fears and stress about i'm not training i'm gonna get out of shape i'm gonna lose my technique this or that you know and then of course maybe for some of those younger dancers who this was their audition season they're worried about am i going to get a job am i going to have to stay in school mm -hmm. another year what could you talk about on those subjects um i think it doesn't matter necessarily due to the current environment with corona or not i think your audition year is incredibly stressful you're terrified that you're going to be the one who doesn't get a job and everyone is out there and like it's i don't know it's already like september and like two people have contracts and you just start worrying like crazy um i think that this is always a stressful process and i've seen a lot of dances where their first try doesn't work out to go an audition and i really think that going back to school for another year is a big plus in a lot of ways i think one of the worst things that can happen is when a dancer who's really talented has a lot of potential and works really hard joins a company too young and you get caught up in the the day-to-day -day pressures and the okay i have to learn 24 swans i have to do this and you you have to be very um independent in the company you have to be on your on your own case to stay in shape to know what you're doing and you don't have this guidance from your teachers that you used to have so i don't think that this is really the end of the world if you really want to do it and you know that you're good enough to be a, pro a professional dancer i really don't it might be frustrating of course but i really think in the long run it can be so beneficial to go back to school for a year so if anyone is in that position i really think that they should look at it from a positive point of view that when they do join a company they will be that much more prepared and confident in themselves because you have a lot of pressure when you first join to learn so much material and fit in and everything so um that would be my advice with that and training this is really hard of course for me as well I, i'm also like thinking okay my turn out when i see it finally in a mirror again after two months it's not going to be what i want or what might i have lost but at the same time i think there's a lot of things that you can do at home a lot of them are mental um visualizing what you're going to do on stage what you want to work on and also there's so many amazing courses you can find online um and so much other kind of strength training that you can do that it can really help you in your dancing so Definitely. i think you can only focus on on today absolutely no i love that point of view i think it's 
I have found it to be super beneficial, not only hearing it myself, because I, you know, where I draw my inspiration from is all of these artists around me. I think it's the greatest gift that we have is to be able to see our colleagues and share in those successes. But, you know, I think you're exactly right in saying that this is still a time we can grow just in a more unconventional way, per se. Um, and, you know, I've had a lot of people write in and ask about, you know, well, obviously it's kind of, it goes without saying that ballet is not your typical career in the sense of time-wise. You know, it, it's not your norm, normal nine to five in an office. And uh, unfortunately, this is something that our bodies don't let us do for necessarily into our 50s and 60s. I mean, if I could, I would definitely be up for trying. But, um, <laughs> you know, it, it, that's the reality of what we do. And so a lot of people have been asking, you know, how do you feel about having to take this time off? Um, you know, obviously this is not like an injury, so it's not something that we're currently, you know, rehabbing and working with, or it's not a personal leave, you know, it, this is something that's, it happened and now we're all dealing with it. Like, okay, I guess, I guess this is the new reality. What are your thoughts on, again, you know, having this much time off in a career that's, you know, time necessarily isn't on our side always? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, um, I think any time in the company flies by, like, I still think of myself as, like, kind of new in the company, and, and I'm still, like, quite young, and then I look back and I realize I've already been in the company six years, so mm -hmm. um, I think that it's always going to fly by, and I think maybe this time could be beneficial because it really puts into perspective how much time you do have and how every show, even if it's a performance that you don't particularly love dancing or a rehearsal period that's extremely exhausting, um, it really just makes you grateful for all of the time that you do have in the studio. And of course, yeah, you feel like you're losing some time, but everybody's in the same boat. Everyone's in the same position. Everyone is dealing with the same thing. So it's everyone's on a level playing field. And I think that you should just take this time, or what I'm trying to do is take this time to realize that when I go back, I'm going to be so much more grateful and enjoy every second, even if it's something that I don't particularly love doing always. For sure. No, I, I completely agree with that. It's It's all about at least for me, um, I feel like it goes without saying that when you become a professional dancer, my mind, my mindset is that, you know, what I'm doing is 90% mental, 10% physical, because at this point, the dancing aspect has been groomed. It's been constantly worked on. It's something that we still constantly work on, but it's not necessarily just the tools. It's how you use them, um, which is something that you know, oftentimes gets looked over, I feel, you know, because we deal with these um, external forces, stress, whatever, situational, situational moments, you know. Um, and, I, and I do want to get your opinion on another topic that's slightly similar, slightly different to what we were just discussing. You know, uh, ballet is a very competitive industry. Um, it's, it's hard, you know, it's a, uh, it can create some amazing opportunities for us, but it can also be something that is, uh, again, stressful or difficult to face when you're in those types of, you know, moments, you know, whether it's in an audition and you're looking to the girl to your right whose foot is bent in half or the girl to your left whose leg is wrapped around her neck like 15 times, you know. Um, and of course, you see things on social media from time to time and for younger dancers, it can sometimes paint a picture of, oh, that's a principal dancer here, and I have to be just like that in order to have that for my career, too. Which, you know, again, I am in the mindset where I see those things and use that as a motivating factor, but for younger dancers, sometimes that's a bit of, you know, it's scary because you think, look at all these things happening around me. Maybe I'm not doing this. Maybe I'm not doing that. What advice could you give on having a healthy body image or a healthy outlook on yourself and not comparing yourself to others? That's a very, um, it's a very um, prevalent question. Um, 
I think that definitely when I was younger and I was going to competitions and you see these very young girls, like some of them are like 12 and I was there like 15 and they're already doing like amazing pirouettes and have these incredible extensions and you just think, how can you compete with that? How can how can you ever be on that level and also these girls that perform so consistently that mm -hmm. when the pressure is on you know they're just ready to go and I just remember being so overwhelmed with that idea and now looking back this was really silly because at 15 of course I'm not going to perform consistently and of course like I'm going to get nervous for being on stage because you perform I don't know how many times as a student it's not like you're on stage every day so I think it's a it's a very beneficial process if you put yourself out there and you go through it. Um, you grow a lot of character and a lot of strength, but it's definitely a struggle. And I think that as you get older, you start to realize that a lot of these um, very famous young competition dancers don't always translate into the next uh, generation of prima ballerinas and principal dancers and when you join the company I think you start to shift your perspective on what dancers bring to the table because you're not just seeing one pas de deux or one variation in a competition you're seeing them carry like a three-hour evening where they are the protagonist and there's so much for them to do and you really begin to appreciate all that they have to offer and most of the time it's not about their extension or, you know, if they nailed those six or seven pirouettes, it's more about how well they told the story and how they kept the audience with them for the entire three hours. And um, I think that you should never compare yourself to, to other people because at the end of the day, it's really what you do on stage and the performances for the audience, not in these uh, galas or competitions as, as a student. And um, I think that you should keep your end goal in mind. And I think the best thing that you can do is instead of watching competition videos, watch full-length ballets and really see the qualities of the dancers that you like and their storytelling ability. And I think that you should focus Focus more on the big picture of what you want from your career instead of what you want right in this moment because I think everyone has a different path and achieves different um, statuses at different times. Absolutely. No, I, I love your perspective on that. You know, it's ballet is already subjective enough and there's already so many stereotypes and stigmas about mm -hmm. this is a ballerina aesthetic or this is what a ballerina or a ballet dancer looks like, you know male or female and I think that you know I'm hoping you know we've already seen a little bit more leniency and we've already seen more growth in what is accepted what is considered beautiful and I hope that we continue to see more of that because again you know I think that understanding from a fundamental level that being you is your greatest asset that is the best thing that we can identify mm -hmm. because Absolutely. nobody else is going to is going to look like you move like you portray a character like you, you know, and I think that we oftentimes get caught up in, I have to do it like this because that's what's good. That's what's liked. Mm -hmm. So thank you for sharing. Yeah, I, I really love that. No, I think that you're completely right, especially like you, when you realize you get to a company and everyone's on a certain level, everyone is good, everyone can actually do the variation and do the steps. The only thing that's going to set you apart from the other people is just to be yourself because it is subjective. Definitely, definitely. So kind of on the topic, of, again, of having a, you know, mental health, you know, or having a healthy image of ourselves and who we are as individuals and as dancers, you know, this has been a time where I personally have been thinking about it. I've personally been living it. And a lot of the people who I've been having on here speak with me are dealing with this in their own ways, too, is, you know, figuring out a little bit more of, well, of course, I'm Ali the Ballerina, and that's a massive part of who I am. It's a big part of my identity, and it's, a, it's the number one reason how people you know, might have known my name in the first place. But it's not, it doesn't define me. It's not all of me. Um, I'm Ali the Human, and that's, that's my principal role in life, always will be. Um, and so asking ourselves the question, like, you know, who are we when we're not dancing? I think that that's something that, you know, opens the door to so many, many conversations. But basically, what I wanted to ask you is, how important is it to identify other interests as a dancer, as a person? Because, you know, oftentimes dancers are multifaceted individuals, multi-talented individuals, and 
you know, we are in an art form where we have to be, you know, 100% in it, like 100% of the time. What we do at home is what is going to impact us the next day in the theater or in the studio. But how important is it for dancers to be able to not necessarily reduce, but to be able to step aside and kind of say, okay, I need to do this for me or this interests me and it's only going to contribute to what I do next time I'm on stage or in the studio? Um, this is, again, a very good question. Um, I think it's quite difficult. I think I myself struggle with it sometimes that I feel like um, you either have colleagues or friends that are very invested in their career and it's what they spend all their time doing and thinking about and in their free time they're looking up other companies and performances and I've never been that kind of person but I've also never felt like I was so incredibly talented at something else or so interested in something else like I have friends that paint and draw and take beautiful photographs and I was always there like mm, it's my only talent ballet um, but I think that as I've gotten older I've realized that my my social life my friends my family the things that I do to help other people um, just my normal activities if I like going to museums or reading books or those also count as myself as a, as a person and I think sometimes because we are dancers it's all about your achievements and how good you are at this that sometimes I think I didn't always um, appreciate that those aspects of, of myself because I thought oh well it's not like an actual um, hobby or activity it's not an actual product at the end of it there's no photograph or painting or novel at the end of that but I think it is really important to have your own life and your own sense of self because I think that it can contribute a lot to your performance I think if you've actually lived your life and had you know heartbreak and happiness and all of these things you can bring them on stage with you and share them and you never want to give a disingenuous performance you really want the audience to feel it with you. And if you've experienced those things, I think you can give so much more. Absolutely. No, I, I love that. I think it's definitely something that some of the most incredible artists of today are incredible artists because they bring so much of their own humanity into what they're doing, you know? Um, yeah. you, you can you can see, there, it, it's almost in the, the sense of they breathe differently. And, and I don't want it to, I don't want to like sound like, you know, I'm picking favorites or, oh, I like to see this, I like to see that. But you can see in a performance the intention and the actual, you know, we are actors as well. But being able to have lived through something and being able to have had those life experiences only contributes to, I think, the mm -hmm. magic that we're able to create. You know, like you said, this is storytelling. This is, it's transcending. That's one of the biggest reasons why people come to the ballet is because they want to be taken someplace out of their normal reality, you know? Mm -hmm. No, I agree with that, and I think a lot of the dancers that I really look up to, they're so confident in their own experiences and who they are that when they're telling the story, they're not really analyzing, oh, did I did I look correctly at my partner this way, or did I do that right? They're really in the moment, and they really trust their own emotions and their own experiences that they've had to just go for it and have the confidence in it because they've been there, and I think that that's really important because if you haven't lived it, you're always going to kind of second guess if you are interpretation is on point Absolutely, yeah. you know and now I, I want to take this conversation I, I wish we could keep talking about this but I've got a lot of points and I have a lot of people who sent things in so I want to take this a slightly different direction now and talk a little bit about um, more ment mentally speaking about you know dealing with challenges um, criticisms critiques I know I am so hard on myself to the point where I will drive myself into the ground and there's no there's no point of return um, and I'm, I'm, I'm guilty of that and I that's something I'm constantly aware of I think it, all dancers are very super self-critical because we do we want to do the best that we possibly can and we're people pleasers what advice what wisdom can you share about dealing with those criticisms, whether it's things that we put on ourselves or maybe things that we are getting from other people. Um, I know as a student, if I got a correction, that would be one thing. I would try to be like a sponge and just absorb it. But then if I was being told something, well, I don't really like that or this, you know, that was something to me that was like, 
oh no, I didn't make them happy. That wasn't right. What do you know? That someone else is not going to like that. Um, I think that that's a constant struggle because in a, in my life, you know, you don't just have your director and your ballet masters. You have lots of people coming into stage new ballets to teach new pieces, to do casting, and everyone's going to have a different opinion about you and the way that you work, and you're just going to mesh with some people and their process, and other times it's going to be more of a struggle. Um, I'm definitely guilty of, like, freaking out when someone told me, oh, it, it wasn't good, like, we're not happy with you, and you start analyzing every detail and why they thought this and why they thought that. Um, most of the time, I think you just need to step back and realize that they're usually being hard on you to motivate you and to push you to be better. You wouldn't be there dancing in the first place, that part or that role, if they didn't think that you were capable of doing it. And I think you have to remind yourself of that. And also, everybody's just human. You know, some people just have bad days. And the way they say things sometimes, you know, it can ruin your whole day and you take it so personally. And actually, they have their own thing going on. Um, so I think that's also really important to keep in mind, like just because they're your superior doesn't mean that they are, aren't living their life any less than you are and have their own issues going on. So I think you just have to be professional about it. And that's what's really hard when you are your product, you are your work, um, is to kind of separate it out and just go, okay, I have a checklist. These are the things I need to work on and separate that from your emotional, personal self. Um, it's definitely hard, but I just try and take a step back and also I think it's always good if you have a nice relationship with your colleagues to go to them and ask for advice or help or have them you know you know help you work out whatever you're struggling with instead of necessarily you know dealing with it on your own or dealing with it with the person who criticized you in the first place for sure for sure you know and, and I love that you brought up being able to communicate whether it's a colleague or uh, someone maybe in a position of authority that has been a huge conversation point so far that I've had on here. And a lot of people have been saying, you know, I don't feel comfortable or I don't want to be disrespectful or I'm worried about being reprimanded for going to the top and asking about this, that, whatever. You know, I can only speak on my experiences. But one of the things that I've been trying to preach on here is something that you just said, literally, we're all humans, you know, and something that I've learned, um, and I'm very grateful that I have this in my company with our, our director, Carlos Acosta, and he, on the first day when he joined Birmingham Royal Ballet, he told us, you know, I don't, you know, I didn't take this job to have power or authority. Mm -hmm. I took this job because I want to be in a position where I can make all of you guys have a career like I did. And that to me was like music to my ears. Because oftentimes you, you do, you see your artistic director, especially if it's your first time in a company, your first job, or um, maybe you're in a second company that gets to work occasionally with companies, you know, typically you see these artistic directors and ballet masters as people that are like, don't want to upset them, I don't want to get in their way, you know, let me just do what I need to do and be done. Um, but yeah, what, what do you think, why do you think that is such an issue or I don't want to say an issue, but why do you think that's such a relevant point where maybe people aren't comfortable communicating to our superiors? Um, I think a lot, in a lot of ways a ballet company works a lot like a school does. And I think that that has a lot to do with this mentality that we have where there's many of us and we have like very few superiors that are very busy trying to teach all of us these things and organize us. So... Um, you definitely and you're being told what to do the whole day and it's not we're not really paid to speak up like our job is to be silent and to do our work and to work hard and so i think a lot of dancers have a hard time being comfortable speaking up and saying something and participating kind of in the workplace environment because sure. our workplace environment isn't really i don't know doesn't really encourage this just it's just the format of our day um I think everyone is human and I think that if you find the right time to speak to someone when they're not too busy and you're respectful about what you have to say and understanding and kind, I think most of the people that are in charge in ballet are really happy to hear from you and are very interested in what you have to say. But of course they are busy and you do want to be respectful of their time because they have a lot on their plate. Um, 
but I definitely think that there's a lot of things that you can do. You don't necessarily have to go straight to your artistic director. I think that your older colleagues, they've probably known your director longer and the way the company operates better. They might have a different perspective. Sure. I think it's really important to learn from the, the generation just above you in the company. And then your ballet masters as well. There's a lot to be learned from them. And, um, and of course, you know, if, if you have any kind of problem, your director is there for you, you know, without you, there's no performance. So I think you should feel comfortable in going to them. They obviously hired you because they liked you. So. Absolutely. No, that's so true. And I think that being able to communicate regardless of what it's about, I think that the communication aspect within our art form is one that doesn't get necessarily the voice or the attention that it needs. Um, in some, in some facilities, yes, it does, but that's not the case necessarily everywhere. And that was really the biggest catalyst for me is being able to create a, a, a platform because we don't have our stages right now where people are able to openly share those experiences and, you know, say like, hey, I'm, I'm living this too. And it doesn't have to be this, you know, we're just going to like lock it all up in a closet and just when we go back to work, we go back to work and we'll deal with it all of ourselves because that's how people self-implode. It's, it's really difficult. And talking more on the subject of, I, I don't mean self-implode is a very fueled word, but um, I, wanted to, I want to talk a bit about, you know, something that happens, um, maybe not to everybody, but it does happen within our world is, you know, what I've been calling, like, the burnout factor, you know, this happens a lot as, as students, this happened to me, um, which is why I was passionate about bringing this up, is, you know, you, we get into this routine of just working and rehearsing and this and that, and, you know, constantly preparing and training, um, which is, you know, again, we do that in companies as well, and sometimes there are days when you just wake up and everything hurts and there's not an ounce of motivation in your body to get you through your day, you know, in moments like that, you know, oftentimes people will reflect and think, do I want to keep doing this? Is this the career for me? You know, and sometimes it's more of a, you know, do I really need to evaluate what I'm doing? Or sometimes it's just a, I need a little bit of a break and I need to identify that. So what are your thoughts on that subject? And then, of course, is that something that you might have experienced at one time in your life? Um, I think a lot of dancers go through a phase, especially when you're, you know, you have big hopes when you join a company. When you're young, you don't always have a realistic idea of how companies work because as a student, I, I mean, I didn't have so much understanding of how things were going to be until I actually got there. So I think when you first get to a company, you're super optimistic, you're ready to work 100% in Saturday class, and you're going to go to the opera on Sunday, and like, you know, you just think that if you work harder than everyone else, then your career will be better than everyone else's, and of course, you have to put a lot into it, and you do have to work very hard, but there's always a balance to that, and um, I think you can overdo it. You can burn yourself out that you really want to be able to be in a position where you can give 150% on stage. And if you're working every single day and staying after work and going on Saturday and Sunday, you're just not going to be able to do that. I think you have to learn how to prioritize where you put your energy and what you're putting it towards, um, which is really hard because when you first join the company and like you're doing Swan Lake, like you want every step to be perfect. And then you realize that you're not even through act one and like you can't get through act two, three and four. Yeah. So I think that that's, yeah, it's, it's something that you learn by, by dancing. But um, I think that, yeah, of course, you can be frustrated when things don't go your way and you feel extremely exhausted and it takes a lot out of you mentally and physically. But I think that if you, it's something that you really love, you can take the time to kind of regroup, think about it, and maybe your environment just isn't right, or maybe your outlook isn't right, maybe you're just putting way too much pressure on yourself, and so you're feeling like you're not meeting your goals, but actually your goals are incredibly unrealistic, um, and I think that you just have to put into priority that this is just, a, a, I mean, I hate to say it because it's not, but it really is just a job. You should love your job, and I want it to be more than that. But if at the end of the day it doesn't work out, like my family is healthy, I have great friends, I love my environment, my home, I have so many other things going on 
that you know maybe work isn't going so great right now but it will pass and it's not it's not the end of the world i think that you just have to reevaluate take the time go easy on yourself a little bit before you start pushing yourself again it's part of a process which is you know mm-hmm. this is a career that again we don't stop working until literally the day we decide that we're going to retire in essence you know um so yeah it it's I could not agree more with everything you just said. It's so relevant and it's so true. Um, And I think, again, it's something that happens across the globe and and within our world. And again, it's something that dealing with isn't always the easiest, you know, trying Mm -hmm. to come to those conclusions on our own. Um, Oh, I I wish I could spend more time on this, but I've got so (laughs) many amazing things I'm excited to ask you. Um, I guess the next one being, of course, you know, we spoke a little bit already um, about some stereotypes and stigmas within mm-hmm. our industry. And this is something, again, um, this is coming from, I think, someone who's maybe not a ballet dancer, but is um, a ballet enthusiast. And they're asking, you know, how do you deal with some um, societal conflicts um, with the, maybe the way the world views ballet dancers or the way the world um, can sometimes classify us as you know oh they're just a ballerina or they're just a dancer or you know because again you know especially at a time right now one could argue we don't need ballet dancers in the world but we need nurses and doctors which in that you know in the current world of course that is unfortunately the reality but to us it's you know it's our passion and we've made a a livelihood out of that passion so what could you speak to maybe the uninformed public about what this career, what this lifestyle really means to us and how it is important for the whole world to be able to seek and take solace and enjoyment in our arts that we're able to provide. Um, I think, yeah, of course, now you, you put everything into perspective and you need doctors and you need all of these essential workers and without them now, the world would be kind of at a standstill. So I think that they have amazing um careers and they they do so much for everyone so i'm extremely grateful to them and really admire them um i think that it was not always an easy decision to choose to be a dancer there's lots of other things that i found interesting and of course i always worried was i going to make it how long was this career going to be but i had a lot of passion for it and i think that um there's something really special about art and i think live art especially because it's one thing you know if you're on your phone and you're listening to an album and it's a completely different experience if you go to a concert um it can be so incredibly fun and enjoyable and you kind of go on a journey with someone and for that time you can really not think about anything else you're like fully immersed in this experience and um i think that if you enjoy dance and you're going to a live performance it can be such an escape from the real world, but it can also tackle a lot of real world issues and emotions. And I think it's a very therapeutic tool for people. Um, I think that I've been quite lucky because my career and my like later education has been in Europe, where people have a lot of respect and admiration for the amount of time and effort that goes into this career. And people are much more open to coming to see a ballet if they've never been before. And it's not... Um, viewed the same way that I think it is in America. I definitely feel like when I go home in the States and I tell somebody what I do, it's like, oh, so what else do you do? Like, are you studying? Do you do that? Is that like your whole job? And that's like, you know, and you have to try and explain like you work for an opera house. That's what you do like every day. It is, it can be really frustrating, but I think that that's just coming out of kind of um, lack of experience and ignorance to the subject. I think that if people really understood Um, and maybe have more exposure to not just like, you know, some school recital nutcracker, but like quality dance, they would understand how powerful and moving and how much had to go into it. Um, So I think that it's really important. I mean, all day long, people are now at home on their sofas watching movies, and they want to be transported somewhere else, just like a good book can do for you. And I think that ballet is one of those outlets, and I think it's very important to keep high quality of 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 the arts going even in these really difficult times absolutely no i I love that and i so agree with it um you know and it's interesting because 
kind of similar to that, um, talking about just our career, the longevity, the lifestyle, making those decisions. Um, I've had a few parents write in and have asked questions, and, and I think this is these are I'm assuming these are coming from parents who maybe have younger dancers in the mm -hmm. home with them, and they're asking, you know, for someone who's living and breathing this right now, as maybe a pre-professional student or someone who is a seasoned professional who's been doing this in the company six plus years, you know, what is what does life after a ballet dancer's career look like? I mean, and obviously for me, it's hard to say because I haven't retired yet. But, you know, I think that to summarize what they're asking is basically what's next for dancers when we're not dancing and what what kind of a career trajectory or what kind of a livelihood do most people pursue when they're when it's not on stage anymore? Um, well, now it's a big transition year in our company here, so I feel like I'm getting to kind of see firsthand a lot of different paths that people are taking, and I think it's really varied. It's really interesting to see some people are going into teaching students and the company. Other people are going into um, becoming certified in Pilates, but I think these are kind of the things that people expect dancers to do. But there's also many of my colleagues who are studying like data science now and went back to school and are doing something like 180 degrees from this career. Um, and I think that the discipline that you have in this career really serves you later in life to find um, something else and pursue it. I think you, you don't necessarily start to plan so early. I think that you don't have to have a plan for the second half of your career, like immediately. But I think as you get older, you start to, you know, sort through what things you would like to do and not like to do. And I feel like all of my colleagues have found really interesting paths and they've all been really successful at them. And I think it's because you take with what you had with you in ballet um, outside. I mean, here in in, in Vienna, um, it's quite uh, a, it's quite a good environment to find a second career and to study. Um, maybe it would be more difficult in America, but I think that you know everything is possible if it's something that you're passionate about. And I think that really, I've seen dancers go off and do everything. Definitely. No, I, I love that. And I think that also, and if I can add one thing to this too, is, you know, a lot of people have asked, well, are, you know, similar to what you mentioned earlier, well, is this your full job? Like, do you study on side of it? You know, I think a lot of dancers, and again, this is totally independent. Everyone does different things. But when I was making those first decisions to start homeschooling or making those lifestyle changes to pursue this career form, education is something that oftentimes gets put second to ballet and you know that was a big fear for my parents and my family because they were wondering you know having a university degree or having a fallback plan is so so important and I think one of the biggest pieces of advice I was given is you know you can do ballet for this amount of time in your life and you could access education until the day you die and that really <laughs> gave them a lot of ease knowing that of course that's something I'm interested in. It's something I'm per wanting to pursue, but also do it within the means of, you know, what's capable and what's possible. Mm -hmm. So that for me, you know, that at least for them was the big thing that was like, you know what, that makes sense. Um, and so for parents out there or even students who are thinking, oh, I maybe want to have a career and then go back to school, I, you know, there's not a path that says you have to do it in this order or at this timeline. It's, it's what you want. It's your choice. You know, we, we choose to do this. So yeah, I, I love what you said. I think that's so, so true and so important. Yeah. I think in, in some ways people see it as a negative, but I've always kind of seen them as a positive that you get to kind of have two careers and two paths yeah. and two different like tracks in your life. And um, yeah, I really love seeing my colleagues now that work in the opera, but they're like in the costume and wardrobe department and they're like costume designers now. And I think this is just the coolest thing. It is. It's really unique. Um, and so I, I want to ask another question. This is something that I've been asking all of my guests on the series so far. And I love the incredible range of answers that it has provided. Um, and that is, you know, obviously we've discussed some stereotypes, stigmas, areas in the ballet that don't always get the light that they need. Um, and so when this time in the world passes and we're all able to get back into, you know, our respective schools, studios, performance venues, what is one thing that you would love to see change or one thing that you would love to see have more care and attention on within the ballet world? 
Oh, that's a difficult question. There's a lot of things that I think um, have been ignored in the ballet world, and there's a lot of things that I think could could be improved. Um, that's quite difficult. I think that um, there's a lot of unrealistic expectations on dancers that you should always be um, so consistent in your performances and in your attitude and you should always be feeling great and ready to go and that, um, you know, that you can always work harder. And I think that this is, is really unnecessary pressure and I think it can be very, like, counterproductive quite often. Um I think that it is really important to have a good like mental health system and I think that it is something that should be discussed because I think that there's so much amazing science out there, sports science, performance science, that, that dancers could really benefit from this the same way that professional athletes in you know, American football do. Um, there's a lot of um, psychology and science behind performing your best. And I think that dancers really neglect this part of their yeah. of their performance, and of uh, and companies do as well. They don't really give their dancers the tools to kind of learn this. Um, so I think that th this is a big part of it. I also think that um, a lot of I think dance companies, and I think also schools. Of course, you know you want to be fit and in shape and, and everything, but I think a lot of um, a lot of schools are afraid to get involved when they start to see kind of a trend with like girls losing more and more weight. They, they're always so afraid of saying the wrong thing and doing the wrong thing to push the, the girls or the guys one way or another as far as the weight scale goes. And I feel like they should be so much more informed about how to talk to people about it. Obviously, like... Um, you know, you can hire a nutritionist and whatever, but I think that it's very important that they know how to speak to people because I've really seen a lot of dancers that the director or the ballet master or the head of the school just didn't know how to approach them and they made things so much more worse when actually they had the best intentions. Absolutely. I, I totally agree with that. That's something that I've also experienced. You know, you see, what whether it's to one extreme or the other, you see maybe a colleague or maybe some people themselves, you see yourself falling one direction or another. Um, and I wish that there were more people, I wish that there were more people in authority who would be able to provide more wisdom on those various subjects, on those various instances, because it is, it's a, this is a difficult career to tap into, especially at such a tender age, you know, like when we're in schools, regardless if it's a major academy with, you know, you know, a hundred kids or a small school in Florida, like where we came from, you know, where it's, you know, a handful, but it is, it's important to nurture the person because, you know, we're nothing on stage if we're not ourselves, if we're not in the best condition mm -hmm. possible, you know, and that, that comes from all angles of, of course, across the board. Um, and before we run out of time, I did want to ask you one final question. Um, and this is something that's been highly requested, you know, what are your top three, two, or I don't know, top two, top three tips for how to survive your first year in a company as, you know, transitioning from student to professional? Oh, okay. The first year is incredibly difficult. Like I, if I think back to my first year, the amount of stress that I had and worry about doing everything right, you, I really had this fear that, you know, you're making your first impression in the company and you can't screw up. And, um, this is very unnecessary pressure to put on yourself. I think the best thing that you can do is be, um, is be humble obviously work very hard um take your work home with you if you don't understand like there's so many dvds you can get because the first season is just learning so much material really try and organize that because i think once you get past this first season it gets so much easier because you know the ballets you know what you're doing and you can really focus more on your dancing so really i think the first season is a lot of learning um that and i think you shouldn't doubt yourself. I think that um, you're trying to be so humble and work so hard that you're kind of showing your insecurity on your face because you are unsure. And I think that then people look at you and they're like, mm, can she handle it? Is she ready for this? Is she ready for that? I think you need to um, have faith in yourself and just 
push forward and um, don't don't doubt yourself because you have what it takes to be there. And as long as you you know your choreography, um, I think you'll you'll be okay. And um, don't be afraid to talk to the ballet masters either. They can be really helpful. And um, yeah, I think you can learn a lot from your colleagues. Observe, look around. I think the first season it's. It's a trial and error, and at the end of it, you feel like a different, a different dancer. It is, and you know, the biggest news flashes. Everyone in the room was in your shoes at one point in their careers as well. Mm -hmm. So, Alaya, I am absolutely overjoyed. Thank you so much for being part of this today, and I am beyond inspired by all of the knowledge and wisdom you've been able to share today. Um, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much, Al. It's really cool that you're doing this and so nice for the whole dance community. So thank you for having me. Thank you so much. For those who are watching this now, thank you so much for being part of today's Conversations with Ali Atwal. If you missed part of this episode or if you would like to maybe share it with a friend, it will be available on the Ali Atwal YouTube channel in just a few short days. And if you want to find out more information on Alaya and be able to follow her on her career, her details are in the artist profile section on aliatwal.com. Alaya, you're amazing. Stay safe and healthy out there. So good to see you. And thank you again. Ciao. Thank you. So nice to see you, Ali. Bye, guys. Have a good one.